Supersonic Travel is coming back again and probably sooner than you expected. But to really understand why this is so exciting, we have to step back in time. Supersonic flights were once available to civilians. And if you're wondering why we're still not flying supersonic, there is a fascinating story behind it. Imagine traveling from New York to Paris in less than half the time it takes now. It might kind of sound like science fiction now, but we really are on the verge of making it happen. So let's dive into how supersonic flights actually began. What derailed it in the first place? and how we're seeing a new wave of innovation and investment. It all starts in 1947, fresh after World War II, when the new global powers are still racing to see who's ahead of each other. Charles E. Yeager, a test pilot and World War II veteran, flew the Bell X-1 rocket plane and broke the sound barrier, reaching speeds over 761 miles per hour, or 341 meters per second, for those less familiar with freedom units. At the time, it was really an achievement of redefining what was possible in aviation. This milestone set off a wave of interest in faster than sound technology, particularly in military aviation. Because less than a decade later in 1953, the F-100 Super Sabre made its debut as the first operational fighter jet capable of supersonic speeds. From there, military jets only got faster with the SR-71 Blackbird clocking in at over 2,200 miles per hour. And the F-22 still flying at about 1,500 miles per hour today. And I don't know if you've ever been near a military base where they are flying at these speeds, but it is loud and scary and crazy to see how fast these things go. But why was supersonic flight confined mostly to military? And the answer to that is pretty simple because flying at these speeds is really demanding on an airplane, it's really demanding in the fuel, and it's really, really, really loud. Flying at these speeds demanded significant resources, fuel, and specialized materials. Factors that made it difficult to imagine civilian use on a large scale. But if you've ever followed aviation, then came the Concorde. Because fast forward to September 26th, 1973, the Concorde took its first ever commercial flight. This was the first ever supersonic passenger jet, and it flew at speeds about 1,350 miles per hour, which is about twice, a little more than twice the speed of the normal airliner you fly in today. The Concorde itself was more of an experience rather than just a way to travel. Now it was going from New York to London in crazy speeds and people were using it for travel, but it became kind of this iconic thing like, oh, I flew on the Concorde. But for its era, the Concorde really was an amazing feat of engineering. It symbolized humanity's ability to push boundaries in aviation. But the Concorde came with a host of problems. Sonic booms, for example, were a really big deal. When a plane breaks the sound barrier, it creates a shock wave that sounds like an explosion on the ground. It's loud. So loud, in fact, that the Concorde was actually restricted to only flying over the oceans and not populated areas. And because I'm not great at explaining exactly how the sonic boom works, watch this short clip and they can explain it way better than me. If a jet goes super fast, it can actually push the sound waves in front of it. And this causes them to literally pile up. After a while, the jet will eventually break through this pile of sound waves, resulting in a sudden change in pressure and causing a sonic boom. But noise for the Concorde wasn't its only issue. The operating cost for the, this machine was also astronomical, which meant that ticket prices just to break even had to be extremely high. A round trip on the Concorde back in the day cost about $12,000, which adjusted for today's inflation is about $70,000 per ticket. For comparison, Spirit might not be supersonic, but I can get all the way from Michigan to Florida for $199 and relatively safely. So the Concorde experience really was reserved for the select few, basically really high business executives or celebrities. Those were the only people that could actually afford this experience. So fast forward to today, are these challenges disappearing? The short answer is no. By its nature, supersonic flights are loud, energy intensive, and to some extent expensive. However, the aerospace industry is tackling these problems with technologies that didn't exist in the 70s when they built the Concorde. There's a new wave of these supersonic companies that are starting to pop out. Boom Supersonic, Exosonic, Spike Aerospace, Arion, and Hermus. I'm not sure I'm saying those right. But these new companies are taking innovative approaches to resolve some of the problems that plagued the Concorde. For example, Hermes, Hermaus, Hermes, I don't, know, I don't know how to say this company, but I will put it right here. Hermes claims that it can fly from New York to Paris in just 90 minutes. They're not just aiming for supersonic speeds, but hypersonic speeds, which 
is Mach 5, which is five times the speed of sound, or roughly 3,836 miles per hour. To put that in perspective, the longest straight line distance across the US from Point Arena, California to West Quality Head, Maine is around 2,892 miles. This jet could cover that distance in under 45 minutes. And you might be wondering, what about the sonic boom? Well, we're not eliminating it completely. These planes will still be loud, but with sound redirection, it's possible to reduce the amount of sound that hits the ground. Engineers are designing planes with sound collecting features on the upper half of the fuselage to push noise upward, away from the ground. The bottom half is designed to be extra smooth to reduce friction and prevent sound waves from radiating downward. This concept is similar to noise canceling technology, just at a much larger scale. Think of how noise canceling headphones use a combination of design and technology to neutralize outside noise. These planes aim to do something similar, redirecting the sonic move upward so it's less disruptive on the ground. And unlike the Concorde, which was a large aircraft, these are new supersonic jets are smaller, resembling private jets in terms of size and seating. This design also helps helps the cost and efficiency, making flights somewhat more affordable. Which brings up another major point, affordability. Will the average person be able to fly supersonic or even hypersonic? Realistically, not yet, no. The estimated ticket prices for these new hypersonic planes are four to $5,000, which compared to the Concorde's adjusted for inflation $70,000 ticket is way cheaper but still very out of reach for most people considering you could buy most of these flights for under $1,000. But with that said, it's definitely, in my opinion, a step in the right direction. However, as this technology is refined and more companies are entering the space, it's possible that we could see these costs come down even further. Imagine a future where supersonic flight is accessible as business class. We're definitely not there yet, but it definitely can be on the future and in the horizon. So these supersonic planes are on their way back and hopefully this time here to stay. And I would argue that this is a good thing. Like any technological advancement, supersonic travel does come with its problems. It's slow to develop and it needs regulation, but ignoring it altogether would miss out on the opportunity to improve it. Because if we weren't actively working on supersonic travel, how could we ever expect to make it better? Yes, it's still gonna be expensive and yes, it's gonna be loud, even if we can reduce it a little. But using and advancing this technology allows companies to gather data, make adjustments, and push boundaries. Maybe in 10 or 20 years, supersonic flights will be even quieter and cheaper, opening up new travel possibilities. We live in a remarkable time, think about it. AI, quantum computing, hypersonic travel, we're constantly pushing the limits of what we thought was possible. So what do you think? Are you excited about the future of travel? Or do you think these advancements should be approached with more caution? Let's talk about it in the comments.